Rishi Sunak was actually not the only European or world leader who had a bad week. There were others in attendance at the D-Day commemoration who's uh, who also had a let's say a bad weekend, and we will turn to them now with yeah, our. I was, well, I was just I was just going to say we can we can move on from the um, from the liberation of Europe from the forces of, fasc- of fascism to talk about the European elections. Exactly, exactly. So we are so excited to be joined by Jaika Chaki. She is a senior research fellow at the Center for European Reform, which is a think tank um, devoted to improving the EU. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Um, Okay, so let's just get right into it. The the sort of top lines coming out of the EU elections were, well, so there was the first, there was the immediate take, which was, oh my goodness, in the most populous countries in Europe, the far right did very well. Then there was sort of a corrective to that, which was, no, actually, the center held. And then there was a corrective to the corrective um, that was, well, the center only held because center-right parties have taken far-right talking points. So if it wasn't a far-right party itself doing well, it was a center-right party that has sort of taken on the vocabulary and policy of far-right, of of their far-right rivals. What what were your what, what was your snap judgment your takeaway what's the headline from you coming out of this past weekend's elections? Well, I think that's on the one hand is a really good summary of where the conversation is right now, uh, and on the other hand, I think it's good that we are speaking right after the UK and the upcoming UK elections because European Parliament elections are at least as puzzling as the upcoming UK elections. Right. Um, I think on the one hand. And let me just perhaps start by that, that there are a lot of misconceptions about the European Parliament. Uh, and, and I think it's useful to clear up a few of them. One is that the, the EP is as powerful as national parliaments. I, this isn't really the case. Um, so in EU speak, it's a co-legislator, um, which means it cannot really initiate legislation. It's not like national parliaments. It's the commission, so the executive arm, that initiates legislation, but then the Parliament DP is needed uh, for approving much of that legislation. Uh, second, then, then it is just like national parliaments. Um, in that sense, not really, because there is no government and opposition side in the European Parliament. Uh, it's a consensus machinery. Of course, it's very important to have a majority. That is how it works. It's important for lawmaking. It's important for policy. But it's not the fact that the side that won is the governing side, and then there is an opposition. Right. Uh, and then perhaps just a third thing, um, which is that it's stable like national parliaments. Again, there is a lot of switching sides, or compared to national parliaments, quite a bit of switching sides between uh, MEPs, members of European Parliament. And uh, and we may see that happening right now. So then just just for perhaps um, top line, my, my top line, um, Takeaway is that this was really 27 different elections uh, Mm -hmm. and not one election. And I think many have said it, but the fact is that people are voting mostly on domestic issues because they are not voting on transnational lists. They are voting for their MEPs uh, locally, nationally, who will then represent them in the European Parliament. Uh, There was a lot of talk about transnational lists, and I think it would be a good idea longer term. I'm not sure the new parliament would be supportive of that, but anyway, so so it's complicated. And I think that's why there's a lot of confusion about whether this far-right surge happened or not. Uh, on the one hand, because yes, far-right parties have been more successful. Uh, when you look at their representation in the parliament, it will grow from 18 to around 24%. Uh, far right and hard right, I should say. <laughs> Again, uh, that's an important distinction. So that's definitely a change. But they will not have party groupings. Uh, they will not have representation at the level of party groupings uh, that is this significant right now. So you have these EU parties, which are made up of the national parties, and uh, and the ones that represent hard right parties are the ECR the European Conservative and Reformists, and the ID, Identity and Democracy. And these have grown, not as much as expected. And then, of course, like one party, the FD, has been fired um, from the ID. Uh, And so there are parties that are currently not in any of the grouping, but are far-right or hard-right. 
So the ones that are not in, not part of a member group don't have that much power in the parliament because they don't have access to the same resources. Right. Um, they don't get speaking time. They don't get um, uh, offices, for example. So in that sense, there hasn't been a far right takeover. I think that's clear. The center kind of held because the two main party groupings, the conservatives and uh, the uh, socialists uh, got as much as before. The conservatives, even the EPP, uh, got more votes. Uh, but then again, the far right did make gains. <laughs> so it's, 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 I think it's a wash, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also important to know that, um, that, as you were saying, perhaps at the beginning, that these elections then had downstream effects for national politics. And that's the other part of the story.